go on a journey to see how a Rise Against Hunger meal makes it into the hands of those who need it most. Welcome to one of Rise Against Hunger's school feeding programs located in Lusaka, Zambia, where over 40 children gather to learn and share a lunch. For many of these children, this will be their only meal of the day. These meals do more than just nourish the body. They allow the students to focus, advance their education, and most importantly, provide hope for a brighter future. Every day, Rise Against Hunger meals are served around the globe in medical clinics, vocational training programs, elder care facilities, and schools just like this. Each meal is a moment to celebrate. It's a step on the path to zero hunger by the year 2030. Let's take a look at how each of these moments is made possible. It all begins when a group gathers to host and take part in a meal packaging event. Before the big day, raw ingredients are ordered, prepped and loaded onto Rise Against Hunger trucks to be delivered. When the event is set up, volunteers begin filing in, donning gloves and hairnets and getting settled at their stations, knowing with confidence that alongside their friends, family and members of the community, they are going to be changing lives with each meal they package. At the conclusion of a meal packaging event, these pallets are sent to our on-the-ground partners via shipping containers. After reaching the destination port, containers are unloaded and pallets of meals are distributed to our impact partners. The meals are prepared in bulk to feed the children at the school. The effect of these meals is community-wide. The hands at our meal packaging events are the last ones to touch the meals before they are unboxed and served to those children and families who need them the most. Together, we can create a world where hunger doesn't exist. Morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church on this beautiful rainy morning. We welcome you here. Hope that you felt welcome coming into this place as we come together to worship. And um, the video we just saw is, is something that's coming up on um, Sunday, October the 13th. There's information about that inside your order of worship. Um, there, there's a little information about where you can go to sign up. You go online, you can sign up, you can go online to uh, make a donation. And all this will be happening here in Abbeville at the Civic Center on October 13th from 2 to 4. And so uh, I, I would encourage you, encourage us as a church to come together with the other churches and folks in this community to partner and try to end hunger um, and throughout this world. And the goal of Rise Against Hunger is to end hunger by the year 2030. You may think that's impossible. Well, nothing is impossible with the help of God. And when God's people come together, anything can happen. So I would encourage us to sign up and be a part of this amazing mission. Um, as we are reminded each week as the body of Christ, as Grace United Methodist Church, we are reminded that a life connected to God and a life connected to one another is the most meaningful life there is. And that is why we are here this morning, to connect to God, to connect with one another, um, and so that our lives may be more fulfilled and be the life that God desires for us to have. Um, inside your order of worship, please take note of the uh, information about Mary's Closet. Mary's Closet um, began years ago, and it, it, was, it was a way for folks in the community of Abbeville to come together donating school supplies to help alleviate um, the struggle that oftentimes teachers have in, in buying, purchasing school supplies. Um, so please keep that in mind. Our Girls of Grace is running this um, drive. When you came in this morning, maybe you saw the little school bus there as you enter the doors, and we're just placing school supplies in that little school bus, and that will be going on through Sunday, August 18th. Please keep that in mind. Uh, youth Week will be happening August 18th through the 21st here at Grace. That's when the youth of Abbeville come together um, and, and worship each evening, so please keep um, those dates on your calendar. And then one, well, actually two final announcements. Um, last Sunday, I want to give a very special thanks to Reverend M.J. Shoemaker and all the women who came together and sharing and leading in worship. Um, we, we are a church who believes God works through all people, not just men. And that's part of the United Methodist Church, and that's who we are. Um, and I'm thankful for the women of this church and how they lead and how they pray and how they serve and how they bless so many lives 
um, not only inside these walls. Yeah, you can clap. That's right. How so many lives are blessed by the ladies of this church, um, but also outside these walls. So thank you, Reverend MJ, for your leadership and all that you do. You are a blessing to us. Thank you. Um, finally, <clears throat> it is August, August the 4th. The other day, our uh, very own youth pastor, Brother Lee Collins, posted something. It's August, which means it's football season. <laughs> Some people go, woo! Coach Nick shaking hands and politicking like never before. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> just teasing. But that got me to thinking. That got me to thinking. Um, during football season, a lot of us end up on the sidelines. Sometimes the same thing happens in the church. We're on the sidelines and not in the game. Sometimes if you're in the game, you want to pull yourself out and go back to the sidelines. But God has called us as the church to be in the game, to be at work together. And I share all that as a reminder that um, following after Christ and being a part of the church is more than sitting in a seat every Sunday. It is doing the work of the church together. And that's just kind of, I guess, a tee up because in his steps we'll be beginning, sign ups will be, will be beginning next month in September. And so let us be thinking and praying about how we, as individuals of this church, how we can use the gifts that God has given you. Because if we are reminded, God said each and every one of us are gifted for the common good. And the common good is to do the work of God's church. So be thinking and be praying. Maybe even be so bold to ask God, Hey God, where do you want me to serve at Grace this upcoming year? And be open to where God wants to use you in this church. Just want to throw that nugget out there. You can put that in your pocket and pray on it. But anyway, stand with me if you can, if you are able. As we remind ourselves the basics, the essentials of the Christian faith. We do this each week with the words from the Apostles' Creed. These words that have been passed down from generation to generation in the life of the church. Let us join together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let's continue standing as we continue our worship and song this morning.
I can't see y'all. I lost my glasses. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have to read scripture today. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, but I want to talk about prayer because that was part of our men's meeting this morning. And uh, for those of you who don't take the opportunity, man, there's some good food, good food, good fellowship too. So come every first Sunday, except for this next one, <laughs> uh, 8.30. But uh, prayer, how do we pray? Who do we pray for? What do we pray for? There's a lot of uncertainty about that. But in Kairos, which is one of our ministries, and Brother Clayton's going to be leading the Kairos walk this fall. Amen. And uh, we talk about something called the mercy seat. I call it the mercy seat. It's a three-legged stool about faith. The first leg is prayer. You've got to have prayer. You've got to have communication with the Lord. The second is scripture. You've got to be in the Bible, reading and learning. But the third is action. You can be a hermit and know the gospel, know the, the Bible completely, but you're not going to do any good if you're on a mountaintop and don't interact with people. So you have to be in action. Any one of those three legs is missing, that stool can't support it. it, falls down. So remember, prayer, it all starts with prayer. Who do we pray for? We pray for friends, for enemies. Pray thankfully for the problems because it helps us to get closer to the Lord. That's a little strange perhaps, but I know I've found that that's kind of like a, a bell Okay, I got a problem. I got to go to the Lord on this because I know I can't handle it well. Pray for those who don't have what we have, who don't have the ability to physically get to church, who don't have food on their table today, who have physical infirmities, who have all sorts of issues. We can't solve these problems ourselves. We need the help of the Lord. So... Don't worry about what you sound, how you talk. The Lord knows. He just wants to hear from us. So let's pray now the way the Lord taught the apostles. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Take a moment greet those around you and welcome them to grace. i 
be seated. This time let us continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering as we have this opportunity and this privilege to give back to God a portion of what is God's, God's tithe, and to go beyond the giving of that tithe and to give an offering. And again, we remind ourselves a lot of the same things every week because we only learn what we already know. And in our giving and in our receiving in this place, lives are being transformed, lives are being changed. And it's all happening by the good news of Jesus Christ. Folks are hearing about and finding out about and learning about the love of Jesus and just how much Jesus loves everybody. And you can't do anything to earn that love and you can't do anything to stop that love. Jesus just loves. And through the giving and the receiving that happens by God's people that we call grace, people are People's lives are being changed. So that's why we give. For the moving out and moving more, the gospel of Jesus. Let us pray together. Lord God, this church has good news. We have good news, God, not because we created it. We have good news, God, because we've received it and we just want to pass it on. We have this good news, God, because we've received it and it's, it is has changed and is changing our life, and we want it to change other lives. And it all happens because of the love of Jesus. And God, I thank you that we have this chance, this time now, to give back to you what is yours, your tithe. God, not because you need it, but because we need to give it. It reminds us everything that we call our own, where it comes from. It comes from the goodness and the grace of who you are. So, God, we give back to you a tithe to say, here it is, God. If it weren't for you, we would have nothing. And we trust you with that tithe. Trust in knowing that good news is being shared not only inside these walls, but outside these walls. So, God, we pray that in the giving and the receiving in this place, that your Holy Spirit would bless and multiply that your Holy Spirit would already be at work in the minds and hearts of those who will be impacted by how this church gives. 
And that, God, we would come into contact with so many lives, Lord, that they would be transformed by the love and the grace of Jesus. And that you would use us, your church, to do that. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? And why should my heart feel lonely? For heaven and home When Jesus is my portion A constant friend is he His Let's stand together as we present God's tithes and our offerings. seated and children can be dismissed for children's church at this time.
Our scripture today comes from 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, from the New Revised Standard Version. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into world, into the world, so that, if you remember, Jason says, always listen, there's something good coming after that, so that, so that we can we take nothing out of it, but we have heard we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. This is the word of God for the people of God. As Brenda was reminding us about the so that, I was reminded of uh, one thing I did not mention earlier. If you're not a part of a Bible study on Wednesday nights, we have one going on in here at 7 o'clock. We're going through the book of James. So if you can make it this Wednesday, we'll be in James chapter 2. Just read it and bring your Bible and a bunch of questions, and we'll try to answer those questions. If not, we'll all go out of here with a big question mark unanswered. But anyway... Please keep that in mind. Stuff, stuff, and more stuff. That's what a friend of mine was reminding me of the other day. He was talking with me, and he was sharing how he and his wife have accumulated stuff, stuff, and more stuff. He said, in fact, in their garage at their home, they don't park their cars in the garage. Their garage is used as a storage building. I've walked into my friend's garage, and you can't hardly move in there. In fact, you've got to walk outside the garage to even change your mind. I mean, that's how packed it is. He went on to tell me in his embarrassment, he said, Jason, not only is my garage full and packed with stuff, he said, we rent two storage buildings packed with stuff. He said, we're paying rent on two buildings every month still packed with stuff. My first thought was, dude, you need to get your mess together. But then I had another thought. Isn't it funny how we can minimize our personal messes when we deem others' messes worse than our own? See, we do the same thing in our spiritual lives. Somewhere along the way, we have begun to understand ourselves as religious when we deem others sin and messes worse than our own. That's just a little nugget. That has really nothing to, ultimately to do with the sermon. I just thought it was interesting. So back to the stuff. As I was talking with him about all of his stuff, that got me to thinking about my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law, Amber's sister, she says it's her desire in life is to be a minimalist. She wants to live simply, and she does. When she told us that, I laughed and, and chuckled, and I said, well, if you're a minimalist, then Amber and I are maximalists. We make up for everything she minimizes on. Because as I was thinking about my friend and all the stuff that he has, I began to reconsider my mess and think, I have so much stuff and junk in my life and in our storage units that I'm still guilty of craving more. See, some of us, many of us, have accumulated so much stuff that we often even forget the things that we have. Like, man, I didn't know I had this. I forgot all about it. It's like finding something new. It's like Christmas morning. Hey, I just found something I forgot I had. Or maybe some of us have fallen into the trap to think our value in this world comes from the amount of stuff that we have. You see, having stuff is not the problem. The problem is when we depend on the stuff to give us value and worth. Think about it this way. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Let me say that again. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. 
And sadly, we, we are told over and over in, in this culture in which we live, in this society in which we live, and what media pushes on us. Media and, and culture and society push that oftentimes the happiest of people are those who have the most. I mean, why, why do you think it is that, that movie stars and the rich and the famous, the professional athletes, all those are presented with such glamour and fame because they have so much? But having a lot don't make you a lot. Having Jesus is what makes you something. Because it's only Jesus that can take nothing and make something. It's only Jesus that can give value to something that thinks they have no value. And so over the next few weeks, counting today and the next three Sundays through the month of August, we're going to be through a little, little mini sermon series called Disciples Values. You can see it there on the screen today. We're going to be talking about what should I do? Disciples Values, and that S apostrophe means that if you claim to be a disciple, this should be your values. And we begin today with the question, what should I do? And we begin today with that question, we're going to read a story that's, that's familiar to probably some of us if we've been in the church. If you haven't been in the church, maybe you've heard of this story. We're going to read a story from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can follow along on the screen. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, let me know. We'll get you one to take home for free. You can write in it and everything. Underline it. Draw pictures if they don't have pictures. Whatever help you understand more about the love of Jesus. Luke chapter 12, picking up in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he, Jesus, said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? See, there's that question. What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. We pick up in this story from Luke's gospel. Jesus is obviously teaching. He's in the midst of saying something. And Luke tells us that someone in the crowd interrupts Jesus in the midst of whatever Jesus is talking about. And as, as I began to think about the one who interrupted Jesus, I began to think maybe, just maybe, this guy had listened to Jesus for some some, some bit of time, and maybe he, he heard or, or, or perceived in Jesus somewhat of a fairness of spirit, that this guy must be fair. I've heard him teach. I've heard what he says. I've seen what he does. But let us be reminded about being fair. The fair only comes around in October. Sometimes life, most times life, is just not fair. No matter how many ways we try to figure it out, life just isn't fair. But this guy comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And it's very likely because this guy is, is asking Jesus this question, it's very likely he's the younger brother because the older brother would get the inheritance first. So he comes to Jesus and he asks, Hey, tell my brother to hook his brother up. Divide the inheritance. What does that look like, sound like today? I would imagine we've probably all seen it. When a family member dies and the ugly arguments begin, a family turning upon each other, fussing over furniture, dishes, silverware, a house, land, maybe even saving accounts that were left by the deceased. 
It's in those kind of moments that we really catch a glimpse of what some people truly value the most. And it's here in this story that this brother, this, this, this guy speaks up. He interrupts Jesus, and he's basically asking Jesus to be a referee in this argument that he and his brother are having. But Jesus, Reynolds wants y'all to know he's here. He's here. But Jesus disengages from the argument. He pulls back from the argument, and really what Jesus is doing when he disengages from the argument, really Jesus is saying this, how can I really judge whose greed is right? And so rather what Jesus does, instead of engaging the argument, rather Jesus drops a, a truth nugget on this man and the crowd. And Jesus says, hey, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed because your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. After dropping this truth on the crowd, Jesus could have quoted from Exodus 20 about you shall not covet. He could have pulled out the law on them. He could have pulled out one of the prophets, Prophet Micah in chapter 2, when Micah reminds God's people to not covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away and not to oppress others. But he didn't pull out the law. He didn't pull out the prophets. Rather, Jesus told a story, and he told a story about what happens when your life becomes consumed with craving, with greed, and with hoarding up. Really, what Jesus wanted this parable, this story to do is to remind all the listeners there, and I think to remind us today that coveting and greed is foolishness. It leads to a foolish way to live. And even more than that, I think Jesus wants us to understand and know that this type of craving, this type of greed, this type of hoarding will lead any person, even a follower of Jesus, if we are not careful. You heard Brenda read it from Paul's words to Timothy this morning. Even a follower of Jesus, if not careful, when putting so much emphasis on goods, money, possessions, and stuff, you can put so much emphasis on that that it takes the place of God and you end up in complete disregard for those in need and in complete disassociation with God because you've created an idol out of stuff. And did you hear the story? The story that Jesus set up, the story about a farmer, this farmer who had been successful, who had an abundance of things. Think about this. In the story, Jesus didn't mention that the farmer had stole anything. There's, there's no mention of theft. There's no mention of how this successful and rich farmer maybe just maybe mistreated some of his workers. No mention of that. There's the idea that, that the sun, the soil, and the rain had all worked together to make this man wealthy, which to me would beg the question, this man should call in, where do my riches come from? They didn't come from me. Obviously, they came from the land, and the land belongs to God. As Psalm 24 reminds us, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. That should be a reminder to us that everything we call our own and everything we call good is nothing but from a gift from God because all good things come from God. We can look at this story and this man and think, you know what? He's pretty wise. He's very conservative with his earnings. He didn't blow his money on frivolous things. If he's not unjust, then what's wrong with the man? Jesus goes on and tells us parable tells us the man was a fool. In verse 17, it begins to unpack why the man was deemed as a fool or foolish with his life. So he asked the question, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. What should I do? Those four words, what should I do? Those four words are the question at the center of all Christian ethics. What should I do? See, this man asked the question, and the answer that he decided ultimately deemed him a fool. And then we hear the amount of times the farmer in the story used the word I. He used the word I six times. So basically what the farmer was doing was building barns filled with self. It's all about me, he thought. But another truth nugget for us to be reminded is that life is not about you. It's not you and the world revolves around you. 
Life is not about you, and neither is your life defined by what you have or what you do not have. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. And this parable tells us that the man ended up living completely for himself. Did you hear it? He talked to himself. Now, maybe you've talked to yourself before, but this man talked to himself. He answered himself. He plans for himself. And in the end, he even congratulates himself. Good job, buddy. But in the end, when it's all said and done, his sudden death proves that he had lived a life as a fool. And it reminds us of the words that Jesus said earlier as Luke records them in his gospel. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And Jesus closed this parable with a simple summary. So for those whose entire life is all about storing up treasures for themselves and are not rich toward God, they will be counted as fools. See, in the end, it does not matter how much stuff you have. In the end, it doesn't matter how rich or successful you were. In the end, it matters what you did with what God allowed you to have. What should I do? Disciples of Jesus value most the things of Jesus. What should I do? It takes us to our takeaway point today. What should I do? Disciples do what Jesus would do. Disciples do what Jesus would do. See, disciples of Jesus value most the things of Jesus. And what are the things of Jesus? The things of Jesus are pretty simple. Love God, love others, and treat others the way you want to be treated. I mean, that's where it all comes down to. And we read this story in the Gospel of Luke. And this story kind of sets us up in the midst of Luke's theme about how Jesus turns the world's values upside down. See, in the very beginning of Luke, in Luke 1, we get a glimpse of, of, of what God values and how God has a special heart for the lowly, for the hurting. Or as some have said about Luke's gospel, God has a special heart for the least, the last, and the lost. Because in Luke 1, we're reminded that this little young girl, maybe 14 or 15 year old, she becomes pregnant with the Son of God. And in her realizing that and accepting that responsibility, she sings a song as Luke 1 records it, that, and she says it this way. Mary says, My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He looked at me with favor on the lowliness of his servant. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. He has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Did you hear that? Or maybe it's in Luke 4 when Jesus is preaching one of his sermons and he's in, he's in the synagogue teaching and he reads from the prophet Isaiah and then he says, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, which reminds us, a little, little insert here, if it isn't good news for the poor, it probably isn't good news. I'll leave that there. But Jesus went on and Jesus said, He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. See, Luke is intentional about letting us know just because you have a lot don't mean a lot. And just because you have a little doesn't mean you're insignificant. The greatest thing for you to have is relationship with Jesus. And in Luke's gospel, if we want to be honest about the rich and the famous, the only rich guy in Luke's gospel who's ever praised is Zacchaeus, and that's because he gave away half his possessions and paid back four times everything he had owned, he would owed. That's the only rich guy that's ever praised in Luke's gospel. So if we are to follow after Jesus and value people and the teachings of Jesus, when we ask ourselves the question, what should I do? The answer is found in a very simple, straightforward truth. Disciples do what Jesus would do. And sometimes that means doing things the world would not do. You heard read to you again this morning from letter to Timothy. See, Paul was reminding the early church about some things, about how your life is not about the abundance of things. And he said it this way, we brought nothing into this world, so we can't take nothing out of it. There's an old country song that talks about you've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse, have you? Because you can't take nothing with you. 
And so 2,000 years later, we, we, even the church, we are still struggling with this idea of possessions. See, no amount of wealth or property can prevent us from disease, from tragic accidents, or even keep our relationships healthy. No amount of wealth or property can save us or secure our lives. Maybe there was a reason Jesus taught more about money and possessions than anything else. Yes, even hell itself. Because he knew that money and possessions have the power to totally consume our lives and take our focus off of who God is. Is there anything wrong with having money and possessions? By no means, but just like Jesus said, take care that you don't let greed consume you. So we have this temptation and this tendency to live as if what we have defines us. But hear me on this. What defines you is Jesus' love for you. What gives you value is Jesus' love for you. And you can't earn that. You just accept that and you receive that. And you receive what Jesus did for you dying on a cross and being raised up from the grave. That's what gives you value. That's what defines you. Because you know what? Nobody can take that away. We brought nothing into this world. We will not take anything out of it. And it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. And we know these things because we've seen these things happen in life. And maybe you've had it happen in your life. And maybe you've got it going on in your life right now. Craving greed and hoarding of possessions, money, and stuff can cause even a disciple of Jesus to wander away from the faith. See, what we learn from this parable is that when you fill your barns with self and not with God, your life is ruined. So what about you? What about me? What about us? What are we filling our barns with? When we ask the question, what should I do? Will it be this very simple answer? Disciples do what Jesus would do with all things and in all relationships. Disciples do what Jesus would do. This morning we have the chance, the opportunity, and the privilege to share a meal at Christ's table. We are reminded each time we come to this table, there is an invitation. Christ our Lord invites all people here. He's not concerned about any affiliation with any other denomination. He's not concerned about what you've done, what you have not done, where you've been. He just invites you here. See, that reminds me of a Another story in Luke's gospel. I'll try not to go into sermon number two. It reminds me of another story in Luke's gospel when Jesus is talking about this great banquet that's going to be. He said, we went out and invited all the people, but ain't nobody showed up. And I'm paraphrasing. Jesus didn't really talk like this. He, he was not from southern Nazareth. Anyway, so Jesus basically said in this story, well, hey, you go out there to the highways and byways and bring them in. You go out there beside the tracks. You bring in the people nobody wants because this banquet's for everybody. And that's the same with this table. See, that's what I love about communion. We all on level ground here. None of us know better than the other 
we're all on the same ground because we come to Christ. And what else I love about this table, this meal, is I realize it ain't about me. Life is not about me. What is it about? It's about Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And church, that is enough. That is enough for me. So we remember the night in which Christ sat with his disciples. That night he sat with a bunch of ragamuffin, knuckleheaded, don't have it figured out people. Some who were educated and some who were just dumb as a load of bricks. But in that meal, he did something special. He took bread. He lifted it up to God and he gave thanks to God. And he broke it. And he gave it to each and every one of his disciples, not just the ones who had it figured out. To each and every one. Even to the one who would betray him. Even to the one who would deny him. And even to the ones who would run like little schoolgirls when they were threatened with danger. He gave it to them all and he said, this is my body. Given for you, take and eat. And do this in remembrance of me. And when the meal was over, he took the cup. He lifted it up to God. He gave thanks to God. He gave it to them all, the one who would betray him, the one who would deny him, and all those who would run like little schoolgirls and desert him at the first sign of danger. He said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this often. Do this often in remembrance of me. So, Lord God, we remember your mighty acts of salvation. We remember the giving of your body and the pouring out of your blood as you died for each and all people. You did that, God, because you love us. And as we remember your mighty acts of salvation, Lord Jesus, we ask through the power of your Spirit that you would make this bread and this wine be for us the body and blood of Christ. So that, so that as we all come to this table today, every one of us sinners broken and struggling with something, we come to this table, and may we find your grace and your peace here. May we be reminded of your amazing love for us. And may we be the body of Christ redeemed by his holy blood as we go out of these doors into a broken and hurting world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The word of invitation is that Christ our Lord invites you here. That is all. He invites you here. A word of instruction is if you would exit from your left, from where you're sitting, there will be a service station in each section of chairs. If you would come with open hands, bread will be placed into your hands. Take the bread, dip it into the cup, place the bread into your mouth. You may circle back to your seat or you may stop at the altar for a moment of prayer. If you were to need special prayer during this time, please know that we have folks who will be ready and willing to pray for you, Reverend MJ Shoemaker and those of the prayer team or myself. We're more than happy to pray with you. At this time, I would invite my servers to please come.
Jesus gives you value. Jesus gives you worth. Nothing in this world gives you value and worth. Only Jesus can. Because Jesus is something that cannot be taken away from you. Let us go. Let us go in the love and the hope of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join hands together. Thank you.